March 17th meeting of the Riverton City Council Finance Committee to order. Um, I would entertain a motion on the consideration of claims. Uh, make a motion to pay the following um, items that we've received. Um, amount of $230,717.64, checks written for payroll and liabilities from uh, March 6th um, in the amount of $493,596.26, manual checks of, of $648, and then one Elan credit card for $1,042.29 that total is seven hundred and twenty six thousand four dollars and nineteen cents do i have a second second thank you um do either of you have any questions on the bills this evening i didn't see any irrelevant i didn't see anything okay um i did have one question that was actually brought to me by a constituent um how how does the city select like for instance just to pull one out of the hat um, the, the lift station and electrical repair the electrical dynamics incorporated how how are, is that determined like how do how do they get the work versus another electrical contractor Hoffman. in town yeah Hoffman or wh whoever I don't just is there a policy how is there a way that that's decided uh your honor the purchasing policy for the city of riverton is anything under twenty thousand dollars we have to solicit uh three informal quotes um why that certain contractor was selected i'll have to look into that um but we also look into a previous history um with a certain piece of equipment so for example with the lift station if a contractor provided the initial install work, using them for the repair work or calling them out for any type of warranty work merits them being selected for that choice. Um, if you would like specifics, I can find out specifically. I was just asked the question and I didn't have a good answer, so I was asking it myself. And Your Honor, if I could add to that, um, I know sometimes, depending on availability is another reason why so I mean if something needs to be fixed rather quickly and we call up three contractors and say you know can you do it within the day or two and someone say oh, I'm busy and so some of it's by that too I mean okay I mean that makes sense one question your honor on that lift station was that a critical item your honor uh, yes it was um, that lift station went down and we actually had clock uh, had employees working for six hour shifts, 24 hours a day for five days straight, operating that lift station so that it wouldn't overflow and flood the area. So there was a manual, some, excuse me, there was some manual um, um, limits that were out so that it wouldn't operate by itself. Your Honor, that is correct. We had an electrical issue. Um, we have originally thought it had to do with the floats. That was basically, that was proved to not be the case. And then we had an issue with the um, electrical system that had to be. So, so you're right that we couldn't just call up an electrician for something like that. Please change my 240 fluorescent bulb. It was a specific item that needed a specific cure or skill set from that electrical company. Okay. Correct. <clears throat> And then I did have one other question, I think for, uh, probably for Courtney. Um, on the on the credit card statements, is there is there a way to determine what accounts these different bills are being registered against from an accounting standpoint? Yes, it is. Oh. Well, Your Honor, I have it right here. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, not part of our packet. It isn't. Okay. And good point. And a lot of that is because we make it by phone. It's not an actual check that we write, so it's not in the claims approval list. Okay. But we can certainly start putting that in your packet as part of that 
I just wonder if it would eliminate some questions to be able to say, okay, you know, this bill was for this training. Yeah. You know, they went they went to the bread board. It wasn't because they were, you know, wanting <laughs> to have lunch with their with their spouse. It was because they were doing a training or, you know, I, I just wonder if it would help. We would absolutely be happy to do that. All right. Anything else? Nope. Anything else for us tonight, Stephen? No, Your Honor. All right. Meeting adjourned. I now call the uh, March 17th, 2015 regular meeting of the Riverton City Council to order at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, would Council Member Jibben lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? And if we could remain standing after that, we'll have an invocation. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Our dear Heavenly Father, we ask for thy presence and spirit with us this evening as we contemplate the business of the city of Riverton, Wyoming, and pray that we might uh, have. Uh, inspiration and guidance at thy hand that we'll be uh, calm and careful with the things that we say and uh, that we might be able to uh, communicate well with each other thankful for the opportunity that we have to uh, serve uh, as members of the city council and staff of the city of riverton and pray that the things that we do tonight will be uh, strengthened by thy presence we do it in the name of jesus christ amen amen <clears throat> Would the uh, city clerk please conduct the roll call? Yes, Your Honor. Councilman Mike Bailey. Here. Councilman Martin Canan. Here. Councilman Jonathan Fabian. Here. Councilman Lee Martinez. Here. Councilman Kyle Larson. Here. Councilwoman Holly Gibbon. Here. Mayor John Lars Baker. I am present, and I declare that we have a quorum. Uh, the chair would entertain a motion for an, uh, for the approval of the agenda. Your Honor, I would move to approve the agenda. Second. It's been moved and seconded that we approve the agenda. Is there any discussion on that? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor votes aye. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is communications from the floor, citizens' comments. Uh, anyone in the audience wishing to address the council regarding an item that's already on the agenda will be given an opportunity to speak later on. Uh, I would ask those individuals who wish to address the council at this time to approach the podium. Identify yourselves for the record and uh, speak into the microphone so that you can be heard. And uh, good evening. Good evening. Congratulations on your new job. Thank you. Anyway, I'm Reverend Lloyd Charles Eckstein. I'm president of Riverton Community Food Bank. At this present moment, we are going to be temporarily probably closed starting April 1. My wife has got. The mesh at 2001, it's caused her to have ovarian cancer. We have to be in Denver. We do have no idea how long it's going to take. Uh, I do know that we've asked some of the people in the community. I've had one person stand up and say, I'll help you. Uh, we've done almost uh, more, over 30,000 pounds of food. Uh, there's like 2,000 people. We do not get any tribal. We do not get any state. We do not get any federal we do not get any county or city help we go out and get fundraising and we do all this good stuff trying to help people out and that's but I, I apologize to anybody that needs food i am very sorry that we probably will shut down april 1. <coughs> we, need, we have to have surgery for my wife and i've got to drive from here to denver and I, this has been going on since no, uh, December, and I've got 9,000 miles on a 95 Subaru that's got 316,000 miles, and it's still going strong, so hope and pray it stays that way. <laughs> and our food bank is technically for all humans. It's not faith-based. And nobody in the, in the board or volunteers gets paid. We do not get paid at all. We're all strictly 100% volunteers, which we have a hard time getting people to volunteer and to be on the board. And I thank you, sir. Well, thank you, and we wish your wife well, and uh, and hope that uh, that all works out for you. Hello, my name is Nancy Eckstein. 
and I would like the city to consider bringing Gardens North subdivision into the city limits. Also, one of my primary things is, is because so many of your officers are there on a daily basis already, and because we're constantly dealing with, um, the Sheriff's Department can't handle what's going on out there by themselves. So the city of police are brought in several times. And also as the uh, food bank vice president, it would be nice to see the city police nearby when we're open, because we have had altercations um, at the food bank. We've had the fence run over twice and one gone shot through the wall. But I would like to see us in the city because two, we are being billed by the, our, the Gardens North Commission is giving us, charging a sewer and then the city of Riverton is charging a sewer. So we're getting double dinged and we can't seem to make our board listen. And there's a fight between who's getting the money, where it's going. And if you bring us into the city then we know that money is going strictly to the city. And since you're out, since we're already in the city, as far as sewer goes, I would like to see you guys bring us in the rest of the way. As a homeowner out there, one of my suggestions, and I've had a lot of the other homeowners that actually live in the park agree that if we came into the city, the city would take the well, and those of us who own property and live in Gardens North would get one year's free water, and after that, the city could charge water per bedroom or bathroom. There are programs in Iowa where they um, charge per how many people are in the household or by how many toilets or by how many bedrooms. And I think that would be a good way to not have to deal with meters and save the city money for as far as water metering out there. But I really believe that we need to be brought in. And uh, also it would be safer for our children. We have a lot of issues um, with dogs straying. And because we're county, the sheriff's department can't do anything about the dogs. We have constant complaints about dogs running free and animals getting run over and children in danger. I believe it would be much to the benefit, the safety of the park to be brought into the city. Thank you. Have Thank you. Thank you. We'll uh, give that some consideration. Um, there's a process that you have to go through in order to make that work, and we'll pay some attention to that, okay? Thank you. Is there anybody else that wants to say something to us? Good evening. Good evening. My name is Nina Miller, and I'm here to present an opportunity for the community to help out our local ambulance and EMTs. Uh, first, I'd like to share with you part of a blog that I had stumbled across, and um, I, then I'll share with you the reason I feel compelled to help. And finally, I'd like to inform you of an event that I'm planning to help promote the community in involvement in this cause. So the blog that I had found is titled Unless You've Been There, and it was written uh, earlier this year by a lady named Di McMath, who is a, an EMT. Uh, she writes, for over 14 years now, I've proudly donned the uniform, but I've had to say that in the last few years, it's been a battle, I've been a bit of a battle with my mind to do it. You'll be okay, I'd say. I'd say to myself, life won't throw you anything that you're not capable of. You know your stuff, what are you worried about? Suck it up and stop being such a wimp. That's just it. I think deep down, what has kept me going for the last few years has been the fact that I still have a bit of belief that if it came to the crunch, my inbuilt training and paramedic instinct would kick in and I would do absolutely everything in my power to try and save the life that faith has plonked me in front of. Because that's just what we do. It's in our blood. But that belief was slowly dwindling and being swallowed up by an overwhelming feeling of needing to protect myself from playing out any more of this real-life script called, You Must See Some Terrible Things. Because unless you've been there, you wouldn't know. You wouldn't know what it's like to still vividly remember the jobs you've gone to. You wouldn't know what it's like to, see the, to still see the look of helplessness upon a husband's face watching you do CPR on his wife who has just suicided by drowning. You wouldn't, you, who you just know that he's going to blame himself for ducking at, down the road real quick to get milk and not being there in time to get her out quick enough. 
Unless you've been there, you wouldn't know what it's like to hear the chilling screams of the woman who was entrapped in her car after a speeding drunk motorbike rider hit her car, killing himself and his passenger, and knowing that she will never walk the same again, let alone her life being the same again. Unless you've been there, you wouldn't know what it's like to still drive around your local area, even 14 years after being in the job, and knowing that your mind will vividly remind you about those jobs as you drive past where they occurred good or bad outcome, or that you would have an overwhelming sense of having to quickly change the channel when you see some sort of trauma-related drama series on TV, because it all just seems too lifelike, unless you've been there. That brings me to why I want to help these guys. And on February 11th, County 10 posted an article titled the County's County EMS's long-term sustainability, and it kind of brought to light what's going on, how they're trying to make ends meet and everything, and the very first comment on that post was, somebody should do something, and there were several others after that that basically animate, that echoed that, and that seems to be the going thing is, Somebody should do something. Somebody needs to help. Something needs to be done. And I agree. But if everybody expects somebody to do something, nothing's going to be done. And I know there's highs and lows in every job, but some of the scenes that these EMTs are called to, I'm not sure I could handle. They go through a lot on a daily basis. They sacrifice their health. They put their lives on the line, they sacrifice time with their families to go on out on these calls on a moment's notice, and I think that if they're not around, then who's going to be the one to respond when somebody gets hit on the road, or somebody has a snowmobile accident, or if a, a mother cry, calls for help because she went to check on her baby and he's not breathing. The EMS is the first ones on the scene to transport people to the hospital if needed, but it seems to me they're the last ones to be considered for funding. They, and I don't think that's right. I don't think it's fair. Um, and I think as a community, as their community as well, we should also do something to help. And, I mean, we offer help for war veterans who come back with, we help them with PTSD and, and trauma-related health issues, but it seems there's a lack of help or the want to help EMTs. So, in light of that, I'm ready to offer a, a way for the community to help. I'm doing a benefit dinner and silent auction next Saturday at St. Margaret's Gym at 6 p.m. Um, I'm selling tickets for $10 each or five tickets for $40. And uh, I've had a lot of help from the community with the benefit dinner and I'm very, or with the silent auction as well as with the dinner itself. And I'm very grateful for that help. And I just wanted to get the word out there. I'd like to sell some tickets and, and get some community involvement in this to help them out. Arthur Ash is a professional tennis player, and he said, start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. I'm trying. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll uh, put that on the calendar, and everybody that's been watching TV tonight got to see that. So. Uh, thank you for coming. You did a nice job. Thank you. Is there anybody else that needs to talk to us at this point in the agenda? Okay. Would the city clerk please read the consent agenda by title only? Yes, Your Honor. Approval of the minutes March 3rd, 2015 regular council meeting. Approval of the minutes March 10th, 2015 council work session. Approval of the minutes March 17, 2015 finance committee meeting. Approval of Finance Committee recommendations for March 17, 2015, and approval of the Municipal Court Report for the month of February 2015. Your Honor. Thank you. 
Are there any other uh, items requiring additional discussion? Um, Your Honor, it's the recommendation of the Finance Committee for claims to be paid in the amount of $230,717.64, checks written for payroll and liabilities for March 6, 2015 in the amount of $493,596.26, annual checks in the amount of $648, and the Elan credit card in the amount of $1,042.29, for a total of $726,004.19. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion for the approval of the consent agenda. Your Honor, I make a motion that we approve the uh, consent agenda as written. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Your Honor, I would abstain from the Finance Committee items regarding Bailey Enterprises and WEX. Thank you. Anything else? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor votes aye. Uh, the next item of business is introduction of dispatchers. Chief? Thank you, Your Honor. As you know, i like to introduce our public officers to you as, as the council and to the community. Uh, Amanda came to us as a dispatcher from uh, Teton County, where she worked a couple years as a dispatcher. You may recall that uh, the last three dispatchers that we hired were not able to make it through training. And so we felt like Amanda was a pretty good bet because uh, she had experience. She also has a master's degree, and so we thought that might be helpful in uh, getting her mental agility going on the radio. <laughs> so anyway, she's come here uh, several months ago. She's made it completely through training, and so she's on her own on the, on the dispatch console now. So we want to take an opportunity to introduce her and have her, uh, her sister Jessica is going to come and, and pin her badge on her tonight. I uh, just wanted to welcome her to the team. Jessica, you want Good, to thank you. Thank you folks for coming. The uh, next item on the agenda is ordinance number 15-004, third and final reading, rezone of lots 15A and 16A, block 25, original town of Riverton. Would the city clerk please read ordinance number 15-004 by title only. Yes, Your Honor. This is proposed ordinance number 15-004 on third and final reading. An ordinance amending a zoning district map of the city of Riverton, Wyoming, designating the rezone of lot 15B, replat of lots 15A and 16A, block 25, original town of Riverton, Fremont County, Wyoming, from, from B residential <coughs> district to C1 commercial district. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion for the approval of ordinance number 15-004 on third and final reading. Your Honor, I move for the approval of ordinance 15-004. Second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Would the uh, city clerk please conduct a roll call vote? Yes, Your Honor. Councilman Mike Bailey. Yes. Councilman Martin Canan. Yes. Councilman Jonathan Fabian. Yes. Councilman Lee Martinez. Yes. Councilman Kyle Larson. Yes. Councilwoman Holly Jippen. Yes. Mayor John Lars Baker. I vote yes and uh, declare that the motion has passed. The uh, <clears throat> next item of business is a public hearing in consideration of liquor license transfer for Sadie's. Would the city clerk please read the report? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the City Clerk's Office received an application for a transfer of a location of a retail liquor license in accordance with statutory requirements. She has to submit an application, pay the fee, and it has to be certified by the Liquor Commission, all of which have been completed and uh, 
That is simply moving Sadie's from 1202 South Federal Boulevard to 301 East Main Street. Thank you. The uh, chair would entertain a motion to open the public hearing. Your Honor, I'll make a motion that we open the public hearing. Second. It's been moved and seconded uh, to open the public hearing. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? I now declare that the public hearing is open. The hearing will be conducted in accordance with state statutes with other, and, <clears throat> and with other applicable laws. I would ask those individuals wishing to address the council to approach the podium and identify yourselves for the record. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak? Seeing none, Your Honor, I would move to close the public hearing at this time. Second. Um, has been moved and seconded that we close the public hearing. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The mayor votes aye. I uh, now declare the public hearing to be closed. The chair would entertain a motion to approve the liquor license transfer. Your Honor, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, change for the liquor license from transfer from the retail liquor license from Barbara Muir. Second. It's been moved and seconded to uh, transfer the liquor license. Uh, is there any discussion on this? All those in favor say yes. Aye. aye. Any opposed, nay? Mayor votes aye. The motion passes. The next item of business is a consideration of a limited retail club liquor license renewal for the Eagles Club. Could we have the city clerk's report? Yes, Your Honor. Um, I apologize for the lateness of this this uh, renewal. This is a renewal application for a limited uh, retail liquor license. We started this process back in late November, early December, and I think the Eagles, Fraternal Order of Eagles, had a little bit of a problem getting their information to the Liquor Commission. They would not certify this application as complete. The license has not lapsed as of yet because it goes until March 31st. Uh, so after hearing from the Liquor Commission last week, we are proposing that the council consider the approval of this um, renewal of a retail liquor license for the uh, Fraternal Order of Eagles. Everything has been received and, and uh, certified. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion for the approval of the liquor license renewal for the Eagles Club. Your Honor, I will move that we uh, approve the uh, Liquor license renewal for the Fraternal Order of Eagles. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Question, Your Honor. Go uh, ahead, Mr. Larson. Uh, why was the, um, why, what was not in order at the time when we <clears throat> originally set forth the liquor licenses of Riverton? that this one is coming late. What was the problem then? Wasn't it uh, sales tax? I don't, I don't, do you, do you know, Madam Clerk? Your Honor, yes, they were not in good standing at the time. But they are now complete and everybody's, everybody's satisfied. From what we understand, yes, sir. Your Honor, my name is Albert Oakley. I'm the uh, chairman of the trustees of the Fraternal Order of Eagles in Riverton. Uh, we were not in compliance because somebody made a mistake. Uh, in the last year and a half, we have had three secretaries that are supposed to take care of these. And unfortunately, I'm sitting in absentee uh, again. I've been secretary for a long time. I have over 10 years. I thought it was time for me to let somebody else do something, and again, I was wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm back. I'm still looking for somebody if anybody's interested. Uh, but. 
right now we're sitting without a secretary again. Uh, I'm filling in for him, but uh, we weren't. Uh, somebody didn't get the word. Uh, my health is not real good. I do dialysis three times a week. And sometimes when I get done with dialysis, I go home and take a nap for about four hours. <laughs> so there's a lot of days I don't get to the to the Eagles. But uh, I, we're doing the best we can with what we've got. And uh, we appreciate your thoughts and your help. Uh, and I talked to Chief Broadhead this afternoon and can't find that paper. I got into the, com the computer and it was in, what I could find was in the recycle bin, but I couldn't get it out. So I, I know there's a hard copy around somewhere. I will find it. Appreciate your thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. Mayor votes aye. The next item on the agenda is the approval of the county plat, Taylor subdivision, replat lot number nine. Could we have the community development director's report, please? Yes, Your Honor. This uh, property is located off of North Smith Road on the north side of Blackfoot Avenue and east of Crow Avenue. The subdivision is outside of the city limits, but because we're within one mile, we do review these plats. This replat will divide uh, lot nine into two lots. Uh, 9A will be 3.51 acres and lot 9B will be 1.5 acres. This acreage is within the Fremont County regulations requiring, me, requiring a minimum of one acre to permit a septic system. All the existing easements will remain in place and no additional easements are proposed. Uh, the city did send out requests for utility reviews. Source Gas sent a reply that they have a gas service somewhere in the area, but they were not able to locate it at the time and they're going to try to verify its exact location. It is a plastic line. It does only serve one other facility and it is probably in the easement in the road. Uh, the owner of the property didn't believe that this line crossed uh, this property. We received no conflicts from any of the other utility companies. The Planning Commission reviewed this plat on March 5th and did recommend uh, approval contingent upon approval by the Fremont County Planning Commission. Um, my uh, planning clerk and I went out with the County Planning Commission today and also reviewed the property. And at that time, they had no problems with the um, property. They had a couple questions that they're going to follow up on. Uh, so it is our recommendation to uh, approve this county replat contingent upon approval by the Fremont County Planning Commission. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. So we're waiting on the gas line. Um, we don't... Um, we, do, we can still vote on that and just put it contingent upon the on uh, the approval of the Fremont County Planning Commission because by that time they will have uh, found out if there is anything. Okay, fine. Thank you. The chair would entertain a motion for the approval of the Taylor subdivision replat of lot number nine. Your Honor, I would I would move to approve the replat of lot nine Taylor subdivision uh, contingent upon the county was it planning commission. Yes, Your Honor. Fremont, Fremont County Planning Commission. Fremont County Planning Commission approving it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Mayor says yes. The motion passes. The next item on the agenda is bare knuckle boxing, fighting by arrangement discussion. Uh, could we have a report from the Chief of Police? Good evening, thank you, Your Honor and, and Council. This has come to our attention this evening just to start a discussion about this idea of bare knuckle boxing, which is occurring within the community. There's a promoter uh, who lives locally in Fremont County. He's here tonight, Corey Williams, and he'd like to address you as well. Uh, Mr. Williams has sponsored at least a couple of bare knuckle boxing matches. Uh, th these matches involve, you know, I mean, essentially it's boxing, um, you know, 
young men getting into a ring uh, for entertainment and and punching each other. And it fits in between several other legal definitions to the point that there's absolutely no regulation over this event. Uh, I have some, some public safety concerns about that. I'm worried about bloodborne pathogens. I'm worried about whether these fighters are being exploited. I'm worried about whether or not there's proper medical oversight of these fights. Um, I don't know that there's any required weight classes or who's making those decisions. The issue is not with Mr. Williams specifically. The issue is that without any regulation, literally anybody, scrupulous or unscrupulous, could come in and take advantage of people to fight for, for profit or for other people's entertainment. And so what I wanted us to do is have a discussion this evening about whether, one, that fits into what we're trying to accomplish within our community, and two, whether we need to have some level of regulation over that uh, and what that level of regulation might be. Thank you, Your <clears throat> Do we need a do we need a motion or sh can we just talk about this a little we bit? We're just going to talk about this, okay? So, does anybody, uh, Mr. Williams, do you want to come talk? All right. Uh, most of you guys know me from the community. My name is Corey Williams. I own a company called Who's Your Daddy Productions. Um, I uh, I started putting together rules and regulations and going through legalities um, of, for bare knuckle boxing seven years ago. First bare knuckle fight I did was in Link, was in Lincoln, Nebraska. It was on a sanctioned mixed martial arts card. Um, I've done a lot of medical research on this, and um, in May of last year, I did the first bare knuckle fight in this in state Wyoming. Uh, it was the first legal bare knuckle event in over 100 years in the United States. Bare knuckle boxing is the root of the sport of the sport of boxing in general. Um, it uh, the gloves were introduced in boxing purpose of making the sport more violent it wasn't to save anything uh, the only point the only safety aspect to gloves is to, is to protect your hands from being broke which allows you to throw more punches and strike people harder more which creates more head trauma from the time that that gloves were introduced the deaths which is the which is the ultimate end um the ultimate end in in, in injury in one of these sports was uh the deaths in them quadrupled they went from 8 to 10 deaths a year in a contest to 150 to 200 a year worldwide. Uh, bare knuckle box is far safer than its glove counterpart. Uh, I've got documentation to prove that. Um, part of doing this and the means that I have, I've been in complete cooperation with the state all the way across the board. They are very aware of what I am doing. I am bonded and licensed through the state of Wyoming as a promoter. I do do gloved events as well. Um, this has been become a pet of mine to try to get this regulated nationally. I am on the, the agenda for this year's Association of Boxing Commissions meeting, which is the federal regulator of these types of sports. Uh, when they found out of, of the things I am doing here, they come to me and ask me to come talk to them. Uh, one thing I do agree with, uh, with Mike on is there does need to be some kind of regulation to ensure some fly-by-night Yahoo doesn't throw a ring up and put somebody in their bare knuckle. That would be, that would be unsafe. Um, I go, I go above and beyond with regulation and, as well as uh, make sure these fighters are safe. Um, this event, these last three events that I've done here in Riverton, were sanctioned. They were not sanctioned by the state athletic commission. They were sanctioned by independent sanctioning bodies that have rules and regulations that they sent an inspector to ensure that I follow. Uh, the rules and regulations are very comparable to those uh, that, that are governed by the state of Wyoming and other states across the country. The only difference, obviously, is there is no gloves and the, uh, the duration of rounds, essentially, are the two primary differences. I do believe there needs to be some kind of regulation in, in the end term of the state uh, stepping in and regulating this. I'm working in cooperation with the state to enact boxing regulations. They do not have boxing regulations at this time. Um, I drafted their initial draft, which they are going to discuss in May. In that draft, it does include a clause that would allow bare knuckle boxing under a special permit condition. Uh, that would be each individual promoter going to them with their rules and regulations and an independent sanctioning body, and then they could decide then if, uh, if they would choose to allow it or not. Um, I have proposed uh, an ordinance idea as well. The, uh, um, I think it, it, it would 
benefit the city uh, to continue to allow these events. They are uh, economically are very well for the city. This last event, um, I've, I've got a packet of information here. I'm going to pass on to you so you can follow along with me. That's okay. Last event. Second page of this. <coughs> last event. My last event, average distance travel Thank of you. the spectator sport. <coughs> Just over 400. Just over 400 people in attendance. That means a lot of hotel rooms. That means meals. Um, that means uh, revenue, outside revenue, being brought into this town. That that doesn't include the outside exposure. Uh, exposure worldwide. We we had three people here from the United Kingdom. They come all the way over from London to watch this live right here in Riverton. Um, that kind of tourism and, and exposure is not is not being offered in any other means. Uh, this is a very positive thing for the community. It also gives the people in the community that would, you know, normally Mike's pulling out of bars because they're getting in fights. They're, they're, uh, they're fighting in an organized situation. If two of these guys were to get in a fight in, in an alley behind bombers. We called 911 and waited for the police to get there in the time they were fighting. One of them could very well get hurt long before they get there. With a, with a referee in the ring controlling it, then that, that's a possibility of that isn't happening. Um, the very first page of that is a proposal that I wrote for a uh, permitting idea so that uh, any promoter wishing to put on any sporting event would have to come to the city council for a permit. In that, you, there is pre-described uh, steps in order to gain that permit that they must, they must present you with. Those steps are very important in keeping the safety, um, the safety of both the fighters of the community and everybody involved. Those would that would ensure that these fly-by-night individuals who, who uh, would just throw a ring up and, and have at this um, are under control. Uh, also, a part of that would be revenue as well. There's no reason the city shouldn't be getting a percentage of tax on this either. Um, it's another avenue for revenue through the city, so on and so forth. These type of events have been taking place in this community, not the bare knuckle specifically, but combat sports across the board. The nine years I've been, lived here, because I've been doing them, um, I uh, many of you guys I have. Mike's been involved with them. His company has, as far as sponsoring things of that nature over the years. I've had a very, very solid, open door relationship with Mike Broadhead as well since he's been here. Have, have I not? Have I not communicated with you efficiently and done everything I can to appease you legally and, and otherwise? <laughs> he, he's, uh, I, I would say that Mr. Williams has been very open and transparent in his dealings with the city and has contacted me. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, with that, uh, I, I've always been very open and had an open book. That's That's... The only way this has been successful anywhere is that the Wyoming isn't the only place I've done these events. The last three have been done here. Um, I haven't had any issues with injuries. Uh, there's some injury rates from the three events that I've done here in Riverton are listed on that statistic sheet. Uh, you can see there's there's a, a dramatic um, difference between gloved and ungloved combat. Uh, gloved adds weight to your hand. It increases force. Uh, there are far more injuries, bruises, lacerations and broken bones involved in gloves than there is without. Without a glove, a fighter is forced to be more selective in their punches. Um, hitting somebody on top of the head is going to break a hand. If you break a hand, you don't fight no more. So you're much more selective in your punches. It's less head trauma. You don't have the major traumatic injuries in bare knuckle that you do in glove sports. Uh, we did have an injury on our last event. A young man got a broken jaw. That broken jaw was from a glove boxing match. It was not in a bare knuckle fight. Um, it is unfortunate that his jaw was broken. It also is an explanation point as to the safety of bare knuckle in comparison to glove, its gloved counterpart. Um, I've also read, uh, I would like to address Mike at the same time with this. Is that appropriate, Miss? Okay. Um, I've, I've read the, the form that he filed and adding this to the agenda. And the way that form reads, uh, very, as he discussed, is there's, there's many legal aspects that touch on portions of what I am doing, but nothing directly regulates it. And the way that form read to me, very much that 
well, here's this law I can charge him with a crime with, but I can't because he's doing this, because, you know, it doesn't apply because of this. And here's this law I could charge him with, but it doesn't apply because of this. So now he's coming to you guys for discussion to say, hey, write me a law so I can file some kind of criminal charge against this guy because I personally don't like it. I, I don't think that's appropriate. To me, that is very much a predatory action and statement and not something that, that should be commensurate of a chief of police. But with that statement as well, I would ask you guys to consider the removal of Mike Broadhead as the chief of police in this town. I am not. I don't feel comfortable or safe dealing with an individual who's a predator. Those are the kind of people that he is, he is in charge to keep out of this community. Is I've, I've had several discussions with him over the years in regards to the people that are in his charge acting as predators and enforcing laws. And now he's doing the exact same thing and bringing this to you in the manner that he has. That I do not appreciate. I, we have a great deal of people here that would wish to speak to you. I don't know if they're all uh, for or against this. Um, there's several of the fighters, including the one I'd like to invite up next is the young man that got his jaw broke in that glove boxing match. And I hope you guys will take the time to consider this uh, appropriately. And I'll talk to you again soon. If you have any questions, I have no problem coming back to uh, answer those at that time. Well, I do have. We do have a few questions. Why yes, don't you sir. just stay here and and, and feel those questions? So, is there any kind of age limit associated with this? Age limit as far as participation, mm -hmm. eighteen and over. Eighteen and over. Yes, eighteen and over as far as the as, as far as the bare knuckle, it is eighteen and over. Um, to have the gloves come off, the fighters must have uh, some kind of verifiable athletic experiences connected. Um, that uh, I don't just take guys off the street and say, "Hey, let's have a let's have a street fight in the middle of the ring." Uh, that would be inappropriate. That would get people hurt. Um, the the uh, level of fighting this is very much in its infancy. So these guys aren't ridiculously skilled by no means. Uh, this is very it's a very beginner it's a beginner's program. Uh, it, a lot of the fighters are from right here in Fremont County. Um, the guys that do not have verifiable experience that wish to wish to compete, wish to start on that low level to gain the experience to get to the level of bare knuckle, compete with boxing gloves. The rules are very similar. The biggest difference is they have boxing gloves. Um, and in some cases, depending on their age and experience, rounds. Uh, in bare knuckle, there are no rounds. One of the safety, one of the safety uh, clauses in doing that is fatigue. We allow for fatigue, fatigue because that's how most of the, bite, the fights end. Uh, we have had zero knockouts in the 23 bare knuckle fights that we've put on here in Rivers. Um, on the same exact cards in 29, in, in 29 gloved fights, we have had multiple knockouts and concussions. Um, that, that, uh, that speaks for itself, I think, in that regards. Anybody else have a question? Your Honor, I have a question, please. Go ahead. <clears throat> Mr. I oh, uh, would you uh, grant uh, a, a, a sponsor a fight bare knuckle fight if no liquor was sold absolutely absolutely uh, that was one of the concerns coming into this event because of the Eagles um, liquor liquor license woes that they were trying to work through when I contacted Mike to let him know I was looking at two possible dates I contacted him to finalize that date it had just been announced that the Eagles may, may be losing their liquor license uh, that was the only concern expressed by Mike that we may not make the revenue that we would if we uh, if we had alcohol, if we lose it. That was his only concern. The, the uh, large part of the, the biggest part of the issue in putting these events on is violence breeds violence. People in the crowd tend to get amped up because they're watching fights in the ring and they wanna try to fight themselves. That's part of the reason for needing pre-described um, guidelines that uh, a permit permitting process on your part would cover. Events I, the events I put on, uh, even Mike can attest, as much, as much as we may not see eye to eye on things, my events are very well controlled. The police are not being called there to having issues. Um, the, uh, the fans are very controlled. The liquor is very controlled. We don't have underage drinking issues. We don't have any of that. I've done multiple fights nationwide, um, gloved, without alcohol, and I'd have no problem doing one without alcohol in the future, um, especially if, if that would appease the city council in the process of allowing the sport to grow, to collect the data and data necessary for me to go national with this when I go to the Your Honor, is that, Mr. Bailey, <clears throat> as I understand, even though this is boxing, it's not regulated by the Wyoming Boxing Commission? At this time, there is not a boxing commission in the state of Wyoming. There is a mixed martial arts commission. 
only thing that they cover is mixed martial arts. They, they do not have rules and regulations in place for boxing. Uh, my agreement with Mr. Brian Pedersen, who is the, the uh, one of three athletic commissioners, he's been my contact with them, is that uh, they would not contest what I am doing. They may not condone it, but they would not contest it as long as I have an independent sanctioning body. Um, the first event I had, I used the BKF alone. I found a second worldwide sanctioning body in the IBKB, which uh, both of those sanctioning forms are attached to that packet that I gave you. So they serve the exact same function as the state of Wyoming does. They are, uh, the BKF is a licensed Colorado corporation and falls under, um, falls under Colorado law as far as, as company uh, business law and whatnot goes, uh, but they have sanctioned bare knuckle fights in four different states uh, across the United States. It, um, bare knuckle is it, it's, it's it's just new it's not it, you know it's historic but it went away for a long time because of gloves gloves weren't reduced for revenue it had nothing to do with safety and i'm trying to bring that back i've i've competed in every combat sport on the planet one time or another and, and i can tell you from personal experience of being in the ring myself it, it, it is far safer i had far less injuries but even bumps and bruises than in a bare knuckle fight than i have ever had in even uh, gloved MMA or boxing. Your Honor, follow up. Um, Go ahead. And as you stated, that bare knuckle boxing is safer than glove boxing. Right. But then you say that you take an inexperienced person that doesn't have athletic experience, and you put them in gloves instead of bare knuckle. That was an agreement again with the state. They didn't want me putting inexperienced Makes fighters to me. It doesn't make sense at all. The, the introduction of gloves. The introduction of gloves. Period only made sense for the purpose of revenue um the uh as as unfortunate as steven's broken jaw is i, I i'm i'm very apologetic that it happened and you know it was a hit on it was a uh, a negative a negative light on the sport entirely and that's that's a large part of why we're standing here today it proved that point even to the athletic commission i was on the phone with brian Pedersen for over an hour this morning in discussion with that and he agrees that that the <coughs> The requirement of putting gloves on was probably uh, it was a request because of their rules and regulations with mixed martial arts and to the the idea of soft the mind because they're so used to seeing gloves they think of gloves coming off and that was the reasoning for him wanting gloves added with inexperienced bouts now I've got him. I'm pretty sure I've got him convinced at this point, based on Stephen's injury. Um, I'll find out when I sit down later. When, later this week, I have a face-to-face -face meeting with the entire that aspect of it again. But that's part of the growth of a sport. And when you when it, first we started with nothing, that first bare knuckle fight, just a typical boxing match, regulated the same way. We just took the gloves off, and this has gone from that to developing an entire set of rules to. To develop an entirely new sport this is a completely new genre of combat sports it it, it it's uh it doesn't compare in any way shape or form uh, aside from the basic striking style rules to boxing or any other sport safety regulations are going to have to be completely revisited and rebuilt which is the process that we are going through right now go ahead Do we have a copy or have you presented uh, uh Chief Broadhead with a copy of those rules or regulations? I have not, but I can have it here by morning. Well, I, I mean, didn't bring a copy with me, but I have. I are, had not. And advanced. they're ongoing. That means they're not finalized yet. The video that I saw on on uh, YouTube looked like a crude ring, uh, two, two straps uh, versus five or six. Uh, looked like somebody could fall through very easily, and uh, it just looked like... Um, I wouldn't say organized because it was so poorly videoed, but it didn't it it didn't lend any credence to what you're talking about. The the staging design is is a completely new design as part of developing a new sport. You stick you stick these kids. Uh, I refer to them kids as because everybody's new, not because of their age. But you stick these young men in a in a boxing ring and take the gloves off. It's just traditional boxing. Part of that is, uh, you know, I, I, in, in modeling 
building this new sport, I followed the guidelines as were laid out, the, the predetermined path laid out by the UFC. When it started out the UFC, everybody thought they were crazy because they locked them in a dog kennel to fight. It took years for the public to overcome that, and, and that's essentially where we're at now. This ring design that came to me, um, it actually came to me feeding my pigs. That's what it. That's what the design. What the design was based on was a pig pen. It, it's a much smaller ring, which promotes action in the fight. Um, the reason that they went away from bare knuckle boxing in the 1800s is the lack of action. The lack. The last fully sanctioned event prior to my events here in Riverton uh, lasted six and a half hours. Selling a ticket to that, nobody's going to sit for six and a half hours. Nobody's going to watch six and a half hours on TV while guys throw three or four punches a minute to a body. Um, which were most punches land in bare knuckle. That that's the reasoning for the the redesign in it. Uh, there's a there's an overall time limit on the bout as well. Uh, for preliminary bouts, there's 10 minutes, and for uh, championship bouts, it's a 15 minute time limit. At the end of that time limit, the fight is determined by the number of knockdowns. Um, there has only been recorded four true knockdowns thus far in the 23 bouts I've done. Doherty leaves knockdowns are. Uh, fighters taking knees they're take, they take a knee because they're fatigued or they're hurt we, we promote that that's part of the safety feature uh, every one of these bouts has ended because if a fighter has said no mas they don't want no more they're too tired to continue and, and that's part of why it's so much safer in boxing a referee stands you up he wipes your gloves off he pushes you back in the action and they, they push and force the action which is where the continued trauma from the fatigue and then recovery and then fatigue that's where those injuries come from so that's the reasoning for the different staging the video you saw was was probably somebody's cell phone um, that we didn't catch to get to get shut down if you would like I can put together uh, the full length video from each one of these bouts and get it over to mr. Broadhead for you guys to review individually it's very organized it is very organized the, the ring is very um, it looks crude in design, but that's by design for for entertainment purposes. It, it's very functional in in in, uh, in what it does, and and very safe. All boxing experts that have come to see this have said the same thing when they walk in. What in the heck is that for a ring? And then when they leave, they've come back and said, "It's remarkable how well this works." Go ahead, uh, Steve. Where did you get that? Your Honor, I think that was a story done by K2. K2? Mm hmm Okay. So there was a link, and it had yours on it, and then had uh, Chief Broadhead uh, discussing it, and then we saw the the uh, uh, bout, the action, excuse me. And that's, so K2, that wasn't your findings, and that was a link by somebody else. The, the footage it showed on K2 was taken off a, a, a YouTube promotional video that was put together for my website. Um, on my website, you'll see that exact video that he used highlights from. It's a very, very low quality. It's cut, it's cut down for the purpose of being able to open up on your cell phone and watch as far as the quality is. I can bring that high. That it's, it's not the highest definition. The, the, um, as far as a... A marketing scheme I do market that ver this very much with the idea of Fight Club you know the, the, the movies the movie Fight Club and the idea of this underground is, is part of what I, I use to per that I've used to promote this in, in drawing viewers uh, the December 6th event we did here in Riverton was broadcast on internet pay-per-view it's it drew hundred and seventy thousand views from right here in Riverton. all local fighters no major names or and that's what's the highlights that you guys saw on that on that uh, website. So, Mr. Williams, explain to me how somebody wins. Uh, well, they, the way we describe <laughs> it. <laughs> somebody just gives up? Typically, it's because they, they take a knee and they quit. Uh, the way we describe it in, in a promotional sense, it's the last man standing wins. It's a fight to the finish. But that finish isn't, the, the idea of that finish is the idea of a dramatic knockout, which doesn't happen. Um, typically, they get tired or they get a hard shot in the stomach, which they weren't expecting. Those hurt a lot more than a hit in the head. I'll let you know that from 100 fights of experience as well. But you take that hard shot to the stomach, and they take a knee, and they give up. Um, you, uh, the One of them that you've seen highlights on on that, on that video was uh, 
Billy March championship fight from this last event. Um, that was the first non-heavyweight national championship in history in bare knuckle. He fought Cedric Shakespeare from the reservation. Uh, both of them have uh, 20, 30 MMA fights experience, um, a handful of bare knuckles. There's only been a handful of them in the United States. And Cedric took a knee and quit. I mean, he, he felt he went down on a body shot. Uh, he caught him right under right under the, the breast and the ribs, and he went down and he didn't get up. He just he sat there until the pre-described time was done. Um, the way the knockdowns work, a knockdown is what constitutes a round in traditional bare knuckles. So when a strike is landed, body or head, and they go down, they're determined down by three points of contact, they have 30 seconds in order to recover. Their corner can give them water, they can... They can check on them and help help them out if they need to to, to get their wits about them. Uh, the referee then comes over and the medical staff checks each fighter at that time to see if they're able to continue. Um, if they're not able to continue medically, we stop the fight, which was the case with, with Mr. Cardenas. Uh, he was screaming and yelling at me in the ring that I'm winning the fight, I'm winning the fight, and he was. Uh, I, when I broke them, it was his opponent was was on his knees in front of him. He landed a shot, and his opponent took a knee and went down. And But when I got to examining him, when I went over to examine him, I could see that, that his jaw was fractured, split at the chin. So the fight was stopped immediately. I called the medical staff, and we got him over to the hospital immediately to be taken care of. He was life-flighted, but the only reason he was life-flighted is because he didn't have a ride to get to a hospital that could do the procedure he needed. It was not a life-threatening injury. No different than the injuries that you see at the rodeo. Go ahead, Mr. Martinez. I have a question now for you, Mr. Williams. <clears throat> in the case of somebody's bleeding profusely, what do you do in that case? When they're bleeding, stop the fight, or do you just keep going? No, we stop the fight. Um, that that was the initial the initial reason that I went to check on Stephen. I'd seen blood starting to come uh, from his lip, so when I walked over and seen him spit blood out into the into the bucket, I went over and examined him. If if there's an excessive amount of bleeding, about is stopped. Each of these competitors are also required to go through HIV and hepatitis testing. It's the exact same examinations that are required by the state and recommended federally by the Association of Boxing Committee. They go through the same medical examination from the examiner prior to the bout as well. Um, we're, we're, we're not the... If you watch some of these, these fights take place all over the world. The United States is the only place that they look at it and go, oh my God, what are you doing? Everywhere else in the world, though, they don't have the medical staff that stands in there and takes care of it. You know, um, the the guys that referee that referee my events. It's been myself, Matt McComey, and Justin Reed. We all have a hundred fights fight experience in addition to being a licensed official in a state and in amateur boxing. So we know what we're looking for as far as concussions, cuts, things of that nature to be able to stop about. Uh, if you watch some of these bare knuckles, you do some research on your own and Google bare knuckle fights, the first thing that's going to pop up is a guy they call Gypsy Boy, James McCory from the UK, and they, they have a makeshift ring of hay bales, and, and they literally beat each other bloody. And that's that's just the difference in regulation from one country to another. They still have not had any deaths in modern bare knuckle in the UK, um, but that's that's the differentiation of of the rules and regulations I am I am working hand in hand with the state and the ABC to develop in comparison to what takes place in other parts of the world. Go ahead. A couple of questions. First of all, is, are there any states that do sanction? Uh, the two states, the um, uh, state of Montana sanctions it, but they only sanction it under statute. They don't have a direct regulator. Um, so the way their program works is as long as you file your paperwork, then you get that permit. You can pretty well do whatever whatever you want to um, within those pre, pre-described rules. It's kind of an honor system there. I wouldn't really count that. The only other state that has given me permission to bring this event, they contacted me. Uh, I've done a lot of promotions there. They want to see it in person so that they can attest to it at the Association of Boxing Committee meeting this summer is Colorado. Um, we're going to do a, an event sometime before the, at the ABC convention in mid-July in Colorado, which will be sanctioned by the State Athletic Committee. Go ahead. Second, sir, I guess, and not really related to this, but, you know, you're talking about alcohol being sold at this event at a club. Is that possible? Isn't a club liquor license for members? So 
So how do they sell liquor at a public event? That's a, that's a. I mean, good. isn't that the reason that the Casper VFW lost their liquor license here a month the, or so ago? Casper, they had a, the Casper VFW lost their liquor license. I know the promoter that was involved in those fights that they were doing there. They, they lost their liquor license because the VFW sold to a private owner and he did not appropriately renew the license and transfer it in. It wasn't directly because of the public events there. He, he, was, he wasn't operating under a legal license to begin with. That's not how it was presented in the media, but that's, that's where that liquor license issue transpired. But I guess my other question still stands. Um, so if it's a club license, sell to the public at an event. Uh, and that's uh, uh, when we were back talking about that earlier that you said that you had control over the way alcohol was dispensed. Correct. Who, who, do you actually have people on staff that are paying attention to that? I do. Or are you simply letting, letting the bar handle that? No, I have my own security staff, a, a few of which are here um, that check IDs. Uh, we have a, a two-band banding system as well as use markers to signify people that are under the age of 21. Um, on that end of stuff, it, it's very well controlled. The, uh, um, I haven't had any instances of somebody even gaining alcohol um, based on that. But that, that uh, I hope that answers your question, sure. But that, that doesn't address yours. <coughs> to address your question, I'm not 100% positive what the legalities are on that. Uh, I am a member of the Eagles myself. I rent the, I rent the space for a ticketed event. Um, they rent that space out for weddings, for all sorts of things. Um, that, that space is what keeps that building open. And, and in fact, the revenue from events like mine is what pays for their taxes and, their, and all their licenses. My events in the last calendar year amounted for somewhere around 70% of their revenue. Even their staff, the young lady, uh, the, the gals that work behind the bar, they averaged 20 or $30 a night in tips. They made over $700 at the last event in tips. And it helps the community in every way, every way, shape, or form on that aspect. Now, what exactly the, the legalities are in reading the uh, the type of license that they have, I can't say. I haven't I haven't read that. I, I haven't read those statutes as to as to the dictation of that license. I do know that I've done these events in, in, in the exact same types of clubs in Wyoming, both Moose Lodges, uh, Elks Lodge, and VFWs. And not had any issues with with a liquor license in any way, shape, or form, as well as in multiple other states. Go ahead. Did that um, answer your question, sir? I answered it the best I could. I mean, that's what I'm saying. I, I wonder how that works. Uh, let me uh, let, let's get done with Mr. Williams. And then we'll uh, ask the city administrator to address that issue independently. Go ahead, General. Thank you. Um, what are the weight classes, or are there weight classes involved in the bare knuckle? The, the first event that didn't have any weight classes. The the, um, the the weight classes were dictated as an agreement with the state by the weight of the competitors that, that we put in. We matched the competitors up based on on size and weight. Uh, the state requested a 20 pound weight variance, no more than a 20 pound weight variance. At first event, I didn't have anything greater than a 10 pound weight. Uh, after that event, we took the, the, the number of participants and we broke down those participants to develop three weight classes, which is similar to how, how the UFC started when they first developed weight classes, as well as uh, traditional tough man contests. We have a middleweight, heavyweight, and lightweight. Uh, lightweight is 155 and below. 155 to 185 is middleweight, and then 185 and over, heavyweight. Those now, after this event, based on the the uh, talent pool broadening, those weight classes are being expanded to five weight classes, and we're going 135 to 160, 160 to 185, 185 to 210, and then and then over is heavyweight. Uh, those five, based on discussions I've had with both the, the ABC and the few states that I'm in cooperation with, uh, will probably end up being the primary weight classes um, for some time in this while this, while this program develops. Good. What type of pre-screening is done to ensure that these athletes are in fact fit to be participating in sport? In, as far as medical pre-screening? Yes. They do a traditional sports physical. 
Um, it's the same physical that, that you do at every um, at every boxing match countrywide. A few of the states with the larger commissions, you get into the you know the the Pacquiao Mayweather type of pay per view events. Um, they require some additional neurological examinations for fighters that have have prolonged experience exposure to boxing because the primary injury in traditional gloved boxing are are, are they're typically neurological. So they they will require an MRI. Um, the but for our purposes, being at the beginning of the sport, we do a complete uh, blood blood screening, you know, uh, what they call a blood trio, which is uh, Hep B and Hep C and HIV. Uh, that's the standard practice nationwide, and then they do a, a basic sports physical in addition to that. They do now that physical is also done post fight as well. They have a post fight physical, and we do do suspensions for competitors. That any competitor that stopped gets a minimum of a 60-day suspension. They're not allowed to participate in an event. Those suspensions are shared with the Association of Boxing Commissions, although they're they're not bound by their own rules to follow them. But it, they they will because you know they still view this as unsanctioned. You know they'll tell you too it's in its infancy. Um, but by open book and sharing is part of the is part of the development of it. A guy like Steven who had his jaw broken, he is he is suspended indefinitely from competition, and that is being carried by the Association of Boxing until such time a doctor sees him fit to compete again. Should the doctor ever see him fit to compete? I don't know. That's up to a medical professional that I'm not. But uh, that those are the medical uh, medical steps we are taking at this point. What are the uh, – who, who is on staff there during the fight that ensures – the safety of the fighters and helps to, you know, protect the we have to have medical a ringside, health. We have to have a ringside. We have to have a ringside medical staff, uh, as pre-described by the state. Um, the state of Wyoming, the commission is new, so they have a little broader scope of who they will allow as far as medical staff. Um, I had a level. I'm not sure how to classify the EMT levels. Mike might be able to uh, help me with that one a little bit. There's two different levels of EMT. One is a basic response EMT, and the other one is a trauma EMT. I think I think they're called one and two, if I remember correct. But we have a trauma. By state, we have to have a minimum of a trauma EMT at ringside, um, which is what we had, uh, trauma-qualified, state-qualified EMT at ringside. And then... Um, a transport unit as well at the event the transport unit again has to do as well uh, because of the how new the commission is here proximity uh, proximity to uh, the dispatch of those transport units uh, has a dictation as to if they actually want one on site or if they're just to be notified in this case the state was satisfied with us just notifying them um, they did come down and have a transport unit there anyway we had a transport unit on site when Stephen uh, hurt his jaw. Um, he went down on his own, uh, at his own accord, rather than going to the transport unit. They they remained there until the end of the fight, to the best of my knowledge. They were Stevens was the I believe the fifth fight, if I remember correctly, and uh, we only had two more bouts after that. Um, I checked on them. I checked when they were outside because I wasn't sure if we were going to send him by ambulance or by let him go on his own. And uh, it was decided by the the ringside uh, ringside medic that he would be fine to go on his own so that's that's what transpired and then finally um i i guess i would be very interested to see the research the back you said you've done years worth of research yes, i would love to see that i'm i'm a doctor of chiropractic i okay i'm familiar with medical research and i would love to see it because i i just have a really difficult time understanding how me I mean, I've I've played around with boxing gloves, and I know how hard, how much harder it is to punch with a weighted glove on your hand than right. it is with my bare hands. And therefore, right. I question whether, in fact, this is safer. I would love to see the research because I I can find statistics to back anything I want, right. but it, that it, doesn't mean that the body of evidence is behind it. it. It's not hard to find statistics to back either either end of an argument. Um, that's why I've, I've, the route I've taken is to develop some of those statistics as well firsthand. Um, the uh, it, it's still too early for me to be able to uh, for my statistics to stand. I've only done 23 
ungloved bouts at this point. So uh, we're, we're still in the infancy of collect, collecting firsthand data. But the, the, per, the uh, I'm having a lack of the name, but the, the study that is referred to the most in this is, is called the Vasquez Report. That Vasquez Report is a 12-year, is a, a um, it's 12 or, 12 or, might even be as much as 20. Let me look at it. I have it right here in front of me. Manuel Vasquez collection. In fact, that uh, chart I gave you that shows the deaths per decade with the with the uh, bare knuckle versus gloved. Research it. Um, I, I will give you. Gentleman who is the preeminent uh, expert in concussions. Uh, he works closely with the NFL. He's a, a physician with the NFL, has done a, a, a report as well as glove boxing versus bare knuckle boxing. And he lays it out very, very well. That report is uh, is actually, I've got it tagged on my Facebook. The, there, there's a YouTube link to it as well. I've got that tagged on my Facebook as well that I, I can shoot you that tag if you send me an email so that you can see some of the some of the research that I've gone through. Thank you. Can I say one more thing? Go right ahead. Um, in, in relationship to your comments about our chief of police, I, I believe Mike Broadhead is nothing less than an upstanding gentleman. I've had the opportunity to serve on this council for over two years now and have found him to be a staunch supporter of business, of freedom, of ensuring that rights are not trampled on. And I don't think I speak out of turn to say that his concern with this event was purely that concern. He was not he he was not coming at it to say let's find a way to slap this guy with fines. I that's that is not what at least I as a council person received. And I for one am deeply offended that you would call him a predator. He's anything but. I would hope that you would curb your tongue in the future. Uh, that's been that's been my experience with the people underneath him not not necessarily him directly I've, I've had a very good relationship with him face to face however the people that work below him I've had all sorts of issues with in that manner and and the way I read my interpretation of it which is what I expressed my interpretation of the paperwork that he filed with you I, I did see very much as as a personal attack on me um, that's that's just my opinion and my view I've got one other question for you. So you're working with the martial arts folks now to try to create some kind of rules at a statewide level to regulate bare knuckle? I have. I have been in cooperation with them. I, I was prior to ever uh, holding bare knuckle event. Do you feel that there's some timeline for that to actually occur? Or? There, There's a, a rules and regulations meeting in May that the rules and regulations I presented to them are going to be discussed among the commissioners and their committee there's I'm not sure how many people exactly are on this uh, this panel committee but there is a committee that's designed just for that the um, where that will go uh, from there is it, it it then goes through the the uh, oh it goes through the legalities of the state and you've got to go to the attorney general so on and so forth uh, that that whole process and then it, then it goes back to them and, which is where it becomes voted and then goes into action. So the minimum we, the minimum time before we see some kind of state regulation on this is nine months. It could take as much as 24 depending on how many how much back and forth there is on the rules and regulations and what and what uh, um, the attorneys will say this is what we need to do versus what what is recommended by that board by that uh, independent Thank you. Is there anybody else on the council that's got any questions that they would like to ask? Go ahead, brother. I just want to go over one more time. I'm kind of slow. I think I was in one of your fights. Um, <laughs> the uh, determination of rounds. Yes, sir. Is 15 minutes or is it 10? The Secondly, is the round determined by a knockdown or a knee hitting the ground or slow of uh, getting down or bending down or stopping or one of the persons hitting the ground it, it, a round is dictated by by a break in the action based on a knockdown or a referee stepping in 
Um, if a guy, there, there was one, one of the bare knuckle bouts, the second bout of the evening, in fact, a young man took three or four un, un, unanswered shots and uh, to, to the head and was wobbled. Um, when his knees buckled and wobbled, I stepped in and stopped it without him hitting the ground. He was at a point where he couldn't defend himself, so I split the bout up. That dictated a round. That, that was what would dictate a round in, under these bare knuckle rules. What's the time difference? The time limit. That's a limit to the maximum amount of time transpired in a bout. So the 10 minutes in preliminary fights, we, uh, it's a 10-minute time limit. So they could have, if, if you have a guy that takes a knee 15 times, they could account for 15 rounds in that 10 minutes. So a, a round could end up being 60 or 90 seconds. The rounds are dictated based on the fighter's performance and the type of blows that are landed not on a pre-described time. The time is only the, the limit that the contest will be allowed to go. Uh, Thank you. Go ahead. So you guys have everybody sign a consent, correct? Correct. Do you have them hold insurance as well? No, I hold insurance. You hold it? I carry insurance. So does it cover the life flighting, the, all that stuff? It does. The, um, the insurance as prescribed by the state is it, pretty low because again, um, when when an athletic commission starts, all the rules and regulations and costs, they keep low so they can build activity in the state. Once the activity builds, those, those come up to the higher demands based on the type of accidents that they're seeing and the event, the, so on and so forth. At this time, the state only requires $2,500 accidental death and $2,500 in medical insurance. I carry $10,000 in accidental death and, and, and medical insurance. So the insurance will cover... Um, up to ten thousand dollars of those damages, and then my general, my company general liability insurance picks up after that and covers the remaining balance. Can I ask one more question. Go right ahead. So on this chart that you gave us, mm -hmm. you have it broke down between the bare knuckled and the gloves, right. but you don't have how many participants were in each. So yes, your statistics show higher on the bare knuckles or on the glove than they do the bare knuckles, but. Do you know how many were in those fights that I, they it, resulted? Because your chart looks really good, but it, it is it is, it is listed in that report. But for for time for time constraints and and time of getting copies together and so on and so forth to give you the entire 300 page report uh, at this time, I didn't see was was necessary. The uh, participant numbers in have grew. Uh, the the largest the largest <coughs> number of participants during the during the Great Depression, um, you know, obviously people had to feed their families, so they did all kinds of things, and that's and you, and you see a huge spike during that time in that chart. Uh, you can take those spikes out based on that, and you still see a a drastic climb. Um, with the increase of population, obviously the number of total number of participants are, are going to are going to climb. But I can tell you that the number of injuries per thousand spectators, which is which is a standard, is 220 injuries in boxing. In rodeo, it's 236. It's very comparable to every other sport that we have, every other sport that we have in this community. Now, it's a different type of sport. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, it, it is apples to oranges, but we're still talking about injury. You still get broken jaws, you still get broken arms. Um, I was at a wrestling meet two weeks ago and saw a 10-year-old get his arm broke, and clean broke through. Had to have surgery to have it reset so it happens in every sport injuries happen um, uh, we, we had a boxer that fell last weekend a young man that had contacted me about coming over from Australia to compete in bare knuckle fights big fan of it he was a young boxer um, he had a professional record of 12 wins no losses with 12 knockouts he lost a 12 round unanimous decision in a championship fight and four hours later died from head trauma. Uh, very nice young man I, I'm, I'm I'm very sorry for his family for their loss, but that's part of the risk that every athlete takes, regardless of the competition that they had. Yes, nationwide in high school football too. That doesn't mean you run into a city council and so go, wait a minute, we can't have football no more because somebody got a boot. It, it's it's an inherent risk that they accept. And that's their right. That's their right under the Constitution. It's their freedom under the Constitution. A freedom that I believe it is is in question here at this point because of, of uh, concerns that could easily easily be handled by a simple discussion. Case. Other questions? Yeah, just one more. So when the EMTs were at your last fight, do they get any kind of payment or anything like that? 
And then are you willing to pay the cops extra for being at your bike? Yes, I am, and I, and I have in the past. Okay. Mr. Williams, thank you. Thank you very much. You bet. And, uh, okay, so, uh, Mr. Weaver, would you, could you address the issue associated with uh, the club liquor license? Yes, Your Honor. And just before that, I'd like to echo what Councilman Fabian has talked about our chief. I have the utmost confidence in him, and I don't believe he would do anything that would be predatory in any way. He's, he's just concerned, and that's why this discussion is being brought up. We have no ordinance to adopt. It's just a, a discussion to talk, talk about. So in regards to the Eagles license for a, a liquor license, and I'll just read it straight out of state statute. It says a club holding a limited retail license shall not sell alcohol or malt beverages for consumption anywhere except within the license premises and for consumption by its members and their accompanied guests only. It shall be the duty and obligation of the club to check and regulate sales to members and their accompanied guests to ensure that all alcoholic or malt, malt beverages sold are consumed within the building spaces or premises. And I guess my interpretation of that would be they're accompanied guest only. This, that doesn't mean you put an article in the paper and invite the whole city of Riverton to come to your event or put a marquee up and say, please come to whatever type of event you're trying to promote. Accompanied guest is where I invite someone, will you come with me to this? And that is under the regulations. But that could be interpreted, I guess, many different ways. It's pretty broad, but that's what the state statute says. Um, and I guess that'd be up to the council to decide if you feel like some of these events that they're holding at are not appropriate when it comes to alcohol. So um, could we, is, is, is there any uh, kind of general, um, let's see, is there a pattern of behavior associated with club liquor licenses across the state of Wyoming from which we might gain some uh, guidance. Uh, in other words, is this a very, you know, is this kind of thing very typical where the, the club actually rents space out and then, and then uses that as a venue to sell alcohol to others? Or, or is, it, is, that a common, is that common in the state of Wyoming? Your Honor, I, I believe it is, particularly here in Riverton. I know in the Eagles and in the Elks, a lot of these places are rented out for weddings, different functions, alcohol is being served, and like I said, it would just be your interpretation of that definition as to, and I, I believe we tried to ask the Liquor Commission, and they're, they're pretty broad when it comes to those. Um, they're not going to give you a set definition as to what it is or what it isn't. Go ahead, Mr. Larson. Would this be different if it were just for weddings? We could watch a wedding on television that was exciting. Would we be here? <laughs> Your Honor, and, th and that's what I'm trying to say here is we shouldn't be narrowing it out just because of bare-knuckle boxing. This, th there's a lot of precedence that's been done in these eagles and uh, of different activities that have happened there that would fall in question with this definition in my definition. Your Honor. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Martinez. As a former member of the Elks and the Fraternal Order of Eagles, I've been to a lot of places in the state of Wyoming and, in, and Colorado and places like that that uh, everybody done, is doing the same thing all the time. It's no different anywhere else. Once they have a, an opening, it, it Evidently, they consider that as a guess. So. Go ahead. Uh, I guess to me, this would be maybe more appropriate for us to look at taking up in a future work session when maybe we could do a little more investigation into it and look at this whole club liquor license issue. And I think it's a totally separate issue from the bare knuckle boxing issue. And, and I think maybe we could get some clarification on exactly what we want to call a guest or, or whatever. But I think it's going to, uh, we need to get some input from these clubs and what exactly they have for rules and that kind of stuff so that we can maybe be, make a more informed decision on that. Thank you. 
Go ahead, Mr. Larson. Have we had any complaints from from uh, City of Riverton uh, law enforcement? I mean, uh, other than the individual that had a broken jaw, have we had any problems with intoxication, car accidents uh, as a result of these? Chief. Thank you, Your Honor. No, we have not. Uh, they've been well regulated. Uh, we've not had an outpouring of fights in the street after them or any DUIs, particularly in, in, as an uptick in statistics after these. Thank you. Your Honor. Mr. I, I I'm curious if there's any of the other people in the audience who had something that they wish to say. Time to one individual, rightfully so, but. Uh, is there anybody else that wants to say something uh, that is different than what we've heard? My name is Craig Robinson. Um, first of all, I come to you all as an American citizen and also as a mother. Um, I am a representative of Who's Your Daddy Productions. I'm Mr. Williams' business partner and his talent coordinator. Um, but more so, he is the, the brain and the experience of the operation. However, I get the unique experience of being a female in a generally male environment. Um, a lot of these the people that come into fighting for us, um, they don't have really another place to go. A lot of them are outcasts. They don't have a lot of friends. They don't have a lot of um, different interaction with other people. I can speak on their behalf because my son is one of them. Um, I brought pictures. This is Taylor Robinson. He's in the video that was on the K2 News. That's me behind him. I cornered his fight. Um, he has done football. He has done wrestling. He has done every sport that was offered to him, and he just didn't fit. Um, Taylor has had a lot of problems as far as emotional. Um, had uh, anger outbursts. We've had him in counseling, and a lot of it was he just didn't fit in. Um, we are social creatures by nature. All of us are, and we all want to be able to belong and fit in somewhere. And this was the only place that my son has gained that kind of confidence in himself um, was through the fight, the, the fighting. Um, I also have a different, I have three sons. I'm a proud mommy of three. My middle son, this is Dylan Robinson. He got offered and invited to the Chris Shivers um, bull riding competition, or that was the nationals in Ogden, Utah. That was the route that he chose. Um, so I've I've had a lot of different discussions. I'm also in the PTA. I have been since my babies were, since Taylor was in the first grade. Um, I've been able to be a stay-at-home mom for most of the time. And I've had a lot of different opinions, for sure. You know, one of my kids is in the rodeo and he gets praised for this. No matter where he goes, he gets the, the wows, the yays, the, you know, you're a Wyoming cowboy kind of thing. He was eight years old when he started. Um, his dad is a rodeo um, bull rider himself, and so he naturally fit in there. I was opposed to it. I absolutely did not. You know, it's my baby. Eight years old, getting on a bull, I didn't want anything to do with it. However, um, I do believe that it is, it's important to let our kids be who they are, and whatever gives them that spark and that fire, that, that feeling of being alive, is, is, it's in, individual. Finally, my baby is a professional bowler, and I didn't even know that was a sport, really, until he got into it, to be honest with you. Um, not really relevant, but I wanted to mention him as well. Um, I wanted to speak on behalf of Taylor. He asked me to speak for him tonight. He couldn't be here. He is a senior in high school still, so he does have a lot of different um, classes that he just can't miss. However, he wanted me to address you all in his behalf and tell you all that this was his first opportunity to fit in anywhere and he wouldn't ta change the opportunity for anything in the world. He just got his first win. He started out, he lost every single match, every bout. Um, Mr. Williams was his original trainer. He got him into it. He got his first win, and he says, Mom, you know, it was really great, but I got friends now. And he goes, it's kind of odd, because I can honestly say that all of my friends punch me in the face. You know, those are his sparring partners, and that's what he, but it, he belongs. He belongs somewhere now, and he has some place to, to call home. Whether he goes in any state, in any county, anywhere, he can go to a ring, a boxing gym, an MMA gym, anywhere, and he fits in. 
um, to speak on behalf of the people, the kids that are here. Um, Stephen Cardenas, he had to excuse himself. He had a prior engagement that he couldn't miss. We didn't know that Mr. Williams was going to take as long as he did. So he's going to try to make it back. He's a little bit long-winded at times. <coughs> oh, he's back. OK, sorry. I guess now I'm being long-winded. Um, OK, so anyways, I just I wanted to say that each one of these, not each one of them, but the majority of them, and as far as being a female in this, um, in this role, I've had the opportunity for these men, young men, to come to me on an individual basis and ask me, you know, is this normal? Is this is this regular? Is this, you know, am, am I is my nerves okay? You know, they they don't know exactly how to feel or, or who to go to, and we've given them that opportunity. Um, it just it's it's the most incredible. I wish you all could see and experience a boy walking a very meek boy walking in at 18 into the ring and his shoulders are down and he's nervous and he's scared and he's going into this ring that has lights and cameras and people around and he goes in and he gives it his all everything that he has and he emerges with a black eye or something and he is a man you watch a boy go into the ring and a man emerge and he has this confidence about him and and the way that he walks and conducts himself it's it's beautiful and to see to see these boys emerge like that is it's priceless to me it, it's it's a lot more than belts titles statistics anything like that um, it, it's just it's it's a beautiful thing to see them develop that way and when I the my own experience to see gloved versus not when you do take the gloves off it then becomes an art form I know our company has very amateur fighters and so they're not very skilled, they're not really skilled enough to hurt each other really, which is a good thing, but with gloves on they're very wild, they just swing, 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 swing. Uh, you take the gloves off, my son explained this to me just like this, that it, it's very deliberate. Every punch that you throw is very deliberate, it's thought out, it's, it becomes an art form. And he's very proud of it, he's very, he's very proud of, of the man that he is and he's becoming and this was a, a big part of it he was in a lot of, of like I said he had anger problems issues and he really does he was lost until this sport gave him that opportunity and it has put him on a track that we didn't think he would graduate we he was skipping school he just and I am proud to say that he is doing very well now he attested to the sport and um, I just wanted to give you a different side as far as the emotional and out of the spark. Thank you. Is there anybody else that uh, is burning to talk to us? Uh, I'm Stephen Cardenas. Uh, yes, I was in one of the previous incidents. Yeah, I ended up getting my job broke. But, you know, it doesn't. It, oh, man, my mouth is going. <laughs> Um, well, basically, if you look at it, I mean, yeah, there is uh, risks to it. There's risks to anything, okay? Um, it's like in one of the interviews that I did with uh, K2 and everything. There's risks in everything that there is. Uh, she had brought up rodeo. I mean, if you look at that, I mean, you look at the risks in rodeo compared to what we're doing, There, it's a lot higher because there's no, uh, how could I explain this? A bull doesn't listen to what basically a ref saying that it doesn't stop you know and then with us uh we come in and we're in control basically there's no controlling whatsoever um from any of the people there none of the staff there uh, on us basically like they're not making us do stuff by what i mean um we are able to stop when we want uh there is no one telling us oh no you have to keep doing this no you have to do this uh we do our own stuff um, if we don't want to fight, we won't fight. If we don't want to keep going, if we're too injured or we're winded or something, kind of like on what they said in the beginning, um, it's all the same. Um, we don't have to. And everything is done there. I mean, I went in there and when I went in, yeah, I was nervous and everything, you know, and I had a lot of, I had a lot of built up aggression and everything else. Um, and it was like what I said on my interview. I mean, it's basically like anger management at its finest in a way. Um, yeah, I had a lot of built up stuff and everything, but the second that that match started and everything, it didn't, everything just kind of went away for, went away from it. Um, 
when I left there and everything else, I felt great. I felt relieved. I mean, yeah, besides the fact my job was broke, but, you know, I still had fun. I still was there, and I still wanted to continue to do it, and I'm still going to continue to do it. Um, basically, it doesn't matter what happens with it. You can't really, or you can't really, if you go to and you say that you're going to shut it down in the city of Riverton, you know, I mean, we can just go outside of the city of Riverton. I mean, the people that want to do it, it's going to happen basically and this is a good way of keeping it regulated of keeping it to where it's in one place at one time people know what's going on they're not stupid um they can sit there and i mean you can't really i mean i, I don't know how it goes both ways on the safety part of glove versus non-glove uh, my job personally if we didn't work if we weren't wearing gloves in one of my mat or in the match that i had i don't it wouldn't have lasted as long as it did the match wouldn't have if we were not wearing gloves. Um, I'm not going to lie. After the fact, my hands weren't even injured after the whole entire match. Uh, that plays on the big safety thing because or being safer because with the gloves on, I didn't get any injuries whatsoever. And I've been in multiple street fights where my hands have been completely destroyed from it without gloves on. Um, and I wasn't able to fight anymore because of it. I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff <laughs> that plays on it. And there's a lot of people that wanted to be here also, but as long as it's been, I mean, there's some people that ran out. Um, it's just a new experience, I guess you could say. I don't, I really don't know. <laughs> okay, thank you for your thank you for your testimony, uh, Council. Do you have do we have any direction for staff? Other than we're going to talk about uh, club liquor licenses at a work session. Right. Your Honor, I, I would move that the city staff investigate the state of Wyoming martial arts rules and see if any of this falls into any of them very close at all, so we could take it up at a further work work session and think, discuss it. I think a work session on this at a later date, maybe. So. Okay. All right. I agree. Okay. okay. Do you have a comment? Yes, sir. My name's Pastor Bill Trollinger. About 10 years ago, I was in the Walmart store. A feller in front of me, about four or five people, had a purple mohawk about this tall. Tattoos on the side of his head. Face looked like he fell face first into a tackle box. A feller walked up behind me and tapped me on the shoulder and said, Hey, Pastor, what caused them kids to do that to themselves? I re my reply was not what he expected. I said, You know, I don't know why they do that. But I'm glad we live in a country where if they want to, they can. The way K2 put this on the news is just trying to ban bare knuckle boxing. Okay, let's talk about banning something. I grew up in an industry that a lot of people would like to ban, and that's ranching. I had worked most of my adult life in a ranch industry, and there are people out there that want to ban it. I rodeoed for 30 years. My passion was to ride bucking horses. I loved it. As the love of my life is saddle up a bronc and go ride. I spent I don't know how many thousands of dollars traveling to rodeos, staying in hotels, paying entry fees, buying gear. But I got to pursue my passion. A lot of people don't understand it. They don't know why. I really don't know why a guy wants to sit down on a horse that wants to throw you off. But I was in love with it. And I got to do it. I had the liberty to do it. Ban and bare knuckle boxing is a ban on liberty. It also affects the economy. There's enough obstacles in this country right now on free enterprise. I don't think we need any more. A little bit about German rodeos. German rodeo rails on a spur designed to spin so it doesn't hurt the horse. That rolling keeps them from dragging. It doesn't scratch the horse's hide. A bunch of people in Germany got involved in regulating rodeos. They made it mandatory that the riders have to tape their rowels so it would be safer for the horses. The problem is the people who made that regulation don't realize that they're actually causing more damage to the horse by the regulation they passed to make it safer. No real cowboy that understands how the mechanics of those spurs work would pass a regulation like that. Regulations were passed for the sport by people who didn't know the sport. So when it comes down to regulation, I think you ought to leave it up to the folks that know what they're talking about. 
Let them come up with the rules and regulations. And don't be another infringement on liberty. You know, they want, there's outfits out there that want to ban your SUV. They think you ought to be fine with going to work you know, on a January morning when it's 20 below and a foot of snow on a bicycle because they don't like SUVs. People ought to have the liberty, as long as they're not being forced to compete or forced to spectate. If you don't like it, don't watch. If you don't want to fight, don't fight. I would have a problem if these kids was being forced to fight. I'd have a problem with that. I don't believe anybody ought to be forced to do anything. The whole gospel is about liberty, freedom to choose. And I think these guys, I say let these pugilists fight. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is resolution number 1313. Council goals. Yeah, one more. Sorry, I should yeah. Have to see. yeah, I'm a girl. But you guys are going to be amazed. I'm going to do this. Bare knuckle. Me, a female. It isn't known. Bare knuckle boxing isn't about boys or men beating the hell out of each other. It's a controlled situation of self-defense. Be behind bombers and have Indians up behind you and you have no form of defense. I've been that girl. I was a cocktail waitress there. It is a scary situation. It is a situation that nobody needs to be in, whether you're a female, whether you're a male, all right? It is a situation that nobody should be there. It's a controlled self. It's control, it is, yeah. My attacker on the street's gonna let me put on gloves so I can beat the hell out of him to keep myself safe. No, it's these, here, it's all I got. And they're shaking because you guys are trying to take it. Please, consider it. It's a controlled way for us to compete as well as protect ourselves on the street. Thank you. My name's Curtis Brooks. I'm also staff help with the uh, with the fights. Um, I understand. A lot of things don't see right in y'all's eyes that we see right in ours. But, you know, it is one of our rights to step in the ring free willingly. Nobody's taking advantage of nobody. I'd rather see them in the ring and out on the streets doing drugs or being stupid, breaking into places or just Going in to bars, starting fights, or out on the streets, period, beating the crap out of one another. It's more of a controlled thing. And as Mr. Williams and Miss Creek said, and everybody else, and I do know for a mathematical certainty, because I have work and I've worked the fights to help keep order keep the rules in play it's there's just a lot of things that's being overlooked that y'all aren't seeing I don't know but like everybody said it is our freedom to do what we see and I like to see it continue because you never know one of these days even as old as I am, I might jump in the ring. I've done it before. I've studied martial arts. And with, with gloves, 
it is more padded on your hands and you do don't do as much damage <coughs> hands like I've done through the years in martial arts my hands it literally hurts at somebody so I don't know what that's worth to y'all but my opinion I'd like to see it continue here in Riverton thank you thank you for a work session, correct? Yeah, sometime in the future. Okay, I'll keep an eye out for that work session. We'll let you know. That's the time the rest of you guys can come during that uh, work session. Thank you guys all for coming. Thank you. I'll let you guys get back to your have have a great evening. Thank you. Good night. So let's talk about resolution number 1313, council goals. City administrator's report. Yeah, do we want a motion on that last a vote? Oh, we actually had a motion, didn't we? Yeah. You made a, you made, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had forgotten also. Okay. So we moved. To, I'll second the motion. The motion was to have a work session on this, at, okay, and to and to uh, try to match this up with uh, the state uh, regulation and something along those lines. Two items. Two items. Yeah, one was to look at the boxing, and the second thing, discuss guests. Yeah, there's two. Yeah, two separate issues. Yeah, yeah two separate issues for work sessions. Okay, so uh, the all those in favor of of uh, you know having future work sessions ad to address these issues, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Okay. So staff has staff has some guidance. Yes. Okay. All right. City administrator's report on uh, resolution thirteen thirteen. Yes, Your Honor. I'm sorry to see everybody go. I <laughs> we just. <coughs> Council goals are pretty important. So uh, the city council had a <laughs> had a goal setting session on Monday, February 9th at Central Wyoming College. Um, the session was moderated by Lynn McAuliffe. Um, senior staff met several times after that session and, and reviewed those along with the mayor. And uh, we sent out the goals electronically. We didn't see, hear any comments, so I. I I think that's a good sign. Um, the council developed the goals and some broad statements to give staff a little more direction. Staff made little changes to the general goals. However, the objectives were changed to make them more specific and measurable. So the three goals that the council determined, the broad goals, were improve business opportunities in Riverton, which includes improving air service, improve facilitate access to high-speed internet services, and reviewing regulations for opportunities to improve individual business ability and ease to do business with the city. Two is improve the quality of life for our citizens by responding to the needs of the community, which includes supporting beautification and continued efforts to beautify the community, including city parks, identify opportunities to provide additional recreation activities and possibly a facility or a recreation center, and continue to work on the issue of public intoxication. Third and final one was build fiscal health in city government, which includes building and maintaining reserve accounts, work on contingency planning for capital projects, research grant opportunities, research methods to reduce leakage or money spent by Riverton citizens for services, goods, and other communities. Consi consider estimate potential economic be benefit of the honor farm sale development and the job core and review the handling and process for construction projects to see if improvements can be made to improve services and or reduce costs. Um, <coughs> we did s discuss this at length, so it's our recommendation that the council uh, um, approve resolution 1313. If you feel um, there needs to be amendments, you can amend those or, or reject them as, as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Um Chair would entertain a motion for the approval of resolution number 1313. 
motion to approve resolution 1313 Riverton City Goals. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. I, I would like to thank staff for the effort that they put forth to actually get this articulated in some concise, coherent way. Thank you. Oh, there's Bonner. Go ahead. only three, or really three bullet points that covered that two hours of discussion, and they've covered it well. That's right. That's right. We got, and, and, and it's something that we can, I think we can measure and look at. So... Thank you. Thank you very much. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Mayor says yes. Passes. Okay. The next item of business is a uh, presented by uh, Council Member Canan. Um, so, Mr. Canan, get after it. Well, sir, I guess uh, when we were doing our tour of the uh, city's facilities several weeks ago, um, three or four of us there in the van and and a, one of the things that came up a discussion about uh, streets when an applicant a business or comes into Riverton and in, onto an unimproved street what they're required to do at, uh, to that city street so that the city can take it over Part of the discussion revolved around that the city ordinances as far as uh, sewer and water were very clear, but there was some discussion about what they had to do as far as paving the street uh, may, not be as, may not be as clear. Uh, I think there was a discussion that the issue came up when uh, Aspen School was being built. The city again got into a... a I don't, want to say, I don't want to say a problem, but I guess an issue with the school district as far as the street at that time and uh, with the new school being developed down on Monroe, uh, again, city staff kind of had a little discussion as to whether they were getting, the city was going to wind up in the same type of situation as far as the street development. Um, so I talked to uh, Mr. Weaver. Mr. Weaver had made a comment that uh, other cities require a three-quarter type development where when an applicant comes in on a, an improved city street, that applicant is required to put in uh, gutter, sewer on their side, pave the entire street. And then if another applicant comes in on the opposite side of the street at a later time, they put in the city, the, excuse me, the sewer and gutter, curb and gutter, I should say, on their side and then that there is a way then to recapture from that applicant some of the cost. But again, get a free ride as far as the street already paved for. So I guess my thought at that time was is that maybe the staff needs to do take a, take a look at that city ordinance. If it needs to be revised and improved, then probably now is the time to do it. Uh, you know, one of our goals we just talked about was trying to make things better for businesses to come into Riverton. Again, if we're going to have a school being brought in, if that issue again is going to affect us as far as how the street gets paved, who paves it, who takes it over, who maintains it, it's best that we get that resolved now. So that was the reason I got with Mr. Weaver. Uh, he gave me the form to fill out, and, and I'm assuming that you've all read through it here as far as probably changing the ordinance to require a three-quarter improvement rather than its current one-half Thank you. Um, is there any... Um, do we have a motion? I guess if it's up to me, then I guess I would make a motion to have city staff take a look at revising that ordinance uh, to require a three-quarter improvement. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? No, Your Honor. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we ought to look at this as, as a, another work session or work it into the, one of the work sessions. And discuss this too uh, uh, more more thoroughly. So 
I would like to make a motion to amend this this motion to uh, include uh, making it into a work session. Is there a second? Second. And moved and seconded to amend this uh, as a uh, work session topic. Um, is there any discussion on the amendment? I don't have any problem with that because, again, I think, you know, probably Mr. Weaver and, and certainly Mr. Butterfield, they're probably more of the experts on this, you know. Um, I guess what I tried to do here was to get that get that discussion and get that uh, get that rolling so it doesn't bother me at all to have the two experts come back to us at a work session and or they can definitely explain it better than what I've done here tonight that would uh, help the city by changing that ordinance thank you your honor go ahead um, <clears throat> I would be fine with the work session but I would I guess like to see maybe some proposed ordinance language at that time so that we at least had a good working document okay any other discussion on the amendment your honor i i guess i don't have any comment on the amendment all those in favor of the amendment aye aye, aye. okay any opposed none mayor votes aye now we're back on the main motion as amended Okay, so the main motion is to have a work, basically to have a work session dealing with three-quarter street improvements uh, when city streets get improved associated with subdivision activities. Is that okay? All right. Any discussion on that now? Yes, Your Honor. I think this is a really good idea because in the past the city has been put in a real predicament sometimes where the city ends up having to step in and complete some of these improvements um, that are really belong to the property owners. So I think I think it's a needed thing uh, that the city doesn't really have a budget item for developing streets and stuff. So it, it really puts us in a financial bind to have to do some of these things. Mr. Larson. Well, I, I would guess the Aspen School, where the city of Riverton ended up having to go in and put about 300 feet of street in on our own because the Capital Facilities Commission would not extend the street to their property line like we would require of any other developer. Mr. Larson? Since I live there, I have some time knowledge. Of Talked to the superintendent about that and basically fell to my shoes about how we were treated. And uh, gave me assurance that that type of situation, schools wouldn't have. But I removed. 115 feet of fence, put it back in at my expense, put it back in on the sidewalks at my expense. And then, fortunately, I wasn't forced to move half of my sidewalk because they didn't go to a 60 foot road versus. I don't know what teeth we've got with the state forcing them to do anything. They built county ground, got a county permit. Didn't want to have water service, sewer service, but then automatically at the final point they did acquiesce to right we got a road for So that might also be a challenge for us at our work session is to determine what impact this might have on the state of Wyoming. <laughs> you know, and and I, I guess to me, I don't think, I think if in my private hat on, if I was going to develop a industrial site in that same area as an individual citizen, the city would make me do those improvements. That's right. And so I think 
we need to look to see if our statutes can be adjusted so that we require any person doing that development that would be set under the same standards as any other person. I'm not wanting myself or any other developer to be put in a different position than the city or the state would, but I think it's important that the city of Riverton doesn't get stuck holding the bag, and that's applied, and I don't think an individual property owner should get stuck holding the bag redoing the sidewalks because of some development. If I was going to individual developer, I'd have to go make an agreement with Mr. Larson, for example, to redo his sidewalks on my own. So again, I don't think it's fair that the state can get by with forcing those over to somebody else, whether it's an individual citizen or the city of Riverton. So I think we just need to take, do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. And I guess that's whether it's a, a developer developing a new subdivision or school being built by the Facilities Commission or the City of Riverton deciding to build a new building somewhere, those, everybody should play by the same set of rules. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mayor votes aye. The uh, next uh, item is uh, Council Committee Reports and Council Member Roundtable. Ms. Jibben. The only thing that I have to say is that I met with Matt Wright this last week and we talked about the Skateboard Association and everything that they're doing. They're really close to their goal, so if anybody in the community wants to donate anything, I just want to reiterate that because he's working really hard to do it and he's really close. So, and he's got a bunch of new ideas that he's going to put in place. So, he's trying. <laughs> he's doing an awesome job. Okay, thank you. Mr. Larson? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, I have two items. Met uh, with the uh, meeting of the agenda of Fremont County Solid Waste Disposal District. And uh, uh, we talked about three important things where raising uh, cost of living 2.8% uh, and that was tabled by the people at the uh, that got to vote. Second thing was uh, trying to reduce the number of injuries that they had had and they had had, uh, I, my memory flex, they had had three uh, shoulder uh, injuries and one uh, blown out knee and I was trying to remember all the times that I worked at Kennecott 15 years that never happened so I was trying to figure out if that happened on the job or those are my questions uh, second thing uh, I got this um, email of these abandoned houses and I showed it to Mr. Weaver and uh, we have <coughs> bunch of properties which have been boarded up but area people feel that these sidewalks need to be cleaned by the owners and the lawns need to be cut or each trimmed which none of that is occurring and so there's a bunch of these this location is on 7th and Jackson the, property is owned by the tribes as far as I know we have uh, about as much opportunity to force the tribes to do that as we do the school commission but nevertheless the citizens that live in this area don't like it That's all they have. thank you Mr. I don't have anything at this time Your Honor. Mr. Billy I guess unless the other two no, I'm, I'm, okay. work, right. work, I had the opportunity to be at the force committee meeting um, last week and again they're sort of in the in-between stage they've got these projects that we talked about at our last council meeting that they've approved to go out to bid um, they're waiting for the weather to clear which hopefully we've got clear streets now so they can go out and uh, determine exactly what the, the bids are going to encompass how much concrete and asphalt and that kind of things need to be replaced and so they're actively getting ready for the summer and to ready to bid projects and do some of that kind of stuff so um, also I've had a couple of citizens comments on the the uh, skateboard park and again I like to applaud 
Mr. Wright and his group of people for, for raising the money and getting that improvement done. Uh, there is some concern among the citizens that the, uh, the current skateboard park is frequented by maybe less than desirable folks doing less than desirable illegal activities. And I, I don't know if we're looking at that in the design of the park to maybe make it a, a better environment that doesn't have places for people to hide and do undesirable things, maybe. <laughs> so I guess that's something we need to look at. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. Mr. Canan? Uh, sir, uh, went to the Chamber of Commerce meeting. Uh, they have their Easter egg hunt coming up in J.C. Park on April 4th at 1 o'clock. They're looking for candy donations. Uh, you can drop those off at the Chamber. Uh, also, the annual Chamber Awards Banquet is going to be on April 17th at the Reach Foundation. And the 50th annual Ag Banquet uh, will be at the Fremont Center on April 25th. Um, finally, uh, the Beautification Committee was able to finally get everybody together in the same room. Uh, so we could at least put our heads together. Uh, tried to come up with some things that uh, we think that the committee should be uh, focusing on, and I think what we're looking for is to try to come up with uh, a couple of things that we can accomplish this summer uh, to try to get the ball rolling. Uh, still looking for from additional members, trying to get some, some community involvement on that committee. So again, I would, if anybody wants to be on that, I would just have them say, Contact if they would have just contact Mr. Weaver so Mr. Weaver can get their contact information. And lastly, I, I read the uh, article in the Ranger uh, a couple of weeks ago. I think it was about the airport board that met. Uh, and I, I want to say thanks to Mr. Uh, Butterfield for standing up for the citizens of uh, Riverton. I think the two ideas that the airport board came up with. Uh, uh, I guess if those are the best two ideas they can come up with, then I, then I guess I'm disappointed, uh, especially about the comment about uh, Riverton not having enough skin in the game. Uh, and I do think that Mr. Butterfield's comment about uh, the city's citizens of Riverton putting over $300,000 a year into that airport, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I've only lived here since 03, but I think they're probably the only folks with any skin in the game. So. Thanks to Mr. Butterfield for making that known to the airport board. Thank you. Mr. Fabian. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the Senior Center Endowment Fund Board will be meeting Thursday at 1215, I believe right here. So um, if anybody wants to attend, it should be riveting. and. Uh, I am still awaiting reply from the um, Parks and Trails Master Committee on on uh, where things are at with the master plan, and uh, I look forward to hearing from them. And I would just uh, echo your comments. Thanks to city staff for making our discombobulated goal goal session and and bringing clarity that. Uh, I, th I thought that was a job very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Weaver? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we talked a little bit about the airport. I'd just like to put a plug in for our cafe up there. Oftentimes when people think about going out to dinner or going to lunch, they don't think about the airport cafe. And, you know, with the struggles that we have up there with airlines and those type of things, um, we need to support that airport cafe up there. So I would uh, put a plug in there for that. Also, um, we will be giving our budget calendar out um, probably in the next couple days to the council, so you can review that. Um, I know senior staff will be having a retreat next week where we'll be um, talking about a lot of different things. And then finally, um, in regards to the skateboard uh, park, we are going to be having an MOU that will be coming in front of the council next meeting just to kind of define the roles between what the city's responsible and what they're responsible. Um, just to put the lines clarity and and we've passed that to them and they had a few comments and so that'll be on our next meeting agenda thank you thank you uh, we're seven minutes past nine I, I'm wondering would you 
support a um, an effort to put a cap on a meeting time and say, you know, we're going to quit at 9 o'clock and, uh, you know, just fold this stuff over to the next meeting or do you want to keep plugging on? I think after a while we kind of get oatmealed. Um, you know, we're not, we're not maybe tracking on the issues quite as well at 9 o'clock as we were at 7. Honor, we make a motion that we go to 9 o'clock, and if we go past 9 o'clock, we have to have a motion to extend that? Yes. Your Honor, I, I think that one of the things we ought to do, too, is limit the... Uh, the time that the speakers have, I think uh, 15 to 20 minutes is too long for somebody to make their point. I think we ought to limit to anywhere from no longer than 10 minutes. That's just my personal opinion. That might reduce that a little bit. I, I, I was hesitant. I tried once to, to kind of move things on, and then it turned out that there were some other people that just felt compelled to get up and and uh, let us know what they thought. And, uh, and so I, you know, and, and I guess that's one of the rights that we have as citizens is to redress our grievances with government. And, uh, and so I, I feel like that's an opportunity, but in this case, I think we're gonna have another opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and it's gonna be a work session and devoted simply to that one particular, that one particular issue. So I'm, I'm um, so, uh, your Honor, go ahead. Do we need a? We can we do a one motion deal, or do we have to make a, a rule uh, that change change the bylaws or something of the mm -hmm. city that we go to from seven o'clock to nine o'clock? Your Honor, I don't. I don't believe you need to make anything in the bylaws. I mean, in the ordinance, it states when the time starts. It doesn't say when it ends. So I think the council can come up with whatever procedure or agreement that you agree to. I think that's that's up to you. Okay, Your Honor. Mr. Bailey. I guess to me, if we're, I think we're required to post an agenda. I think it would we would be remiss if we had somebody that would happen to be the last item on the agenda and just put them off. And so I think maybe by talk, doing what like Lee was saying is keep the comments somewhat limited we maybe could alleviate our reasons for going too late and then again if we get to this point where we just have unattended business if you want to call it that after nine maybe that's something we could put off but we could do it on a case-by-case -case basis that way that way we don't have somebody sitting in the audience for two hours and then their item comes up and we decide to oh it's nine o'clock we're going home right well yeah i understand that yeah your honor Go ahead. Uh, and I agree with you on that statement that uh, that's one of our liberties to speak up. But when it gets repetitive and three or four times to saying the same thing, then I think we ought to limit that. And, Your Honor, and it's also, I think, more responsible to keep individual comments limited so that we have the ability to hear from multiple other people. I'd rather hear from 10 people for 10 minutes each than I would one person for. 60 minutes I was but uh, this evening was I, I mean we got a lot of information from mr. Williams that he wouldn't have volunteered you know and if he'd had a prepared 10 minute statement then he wouldn't we wouldn't have gotten that information so being able to to play back and forth with him but maybe it was more appropriate to put that in a work session Your Honor, I would be supportive of a end time realizing that you know, if we are in that situation where there's somebody waiting two hours and we think we as a council are conscientious enough to extend in that in that situation, but I would be supportive of a firm ending time. Okay, I'm waiting for a motion. Your Honor, I'd like to make a motion that we start our meetings at seven o'clock for the regular meetings and that we finish at nine o'clock and any time after nine o'clock, we have to make a motion to extend for a certain period of time. Thank you. Second. Seconded. <clears throat> Been moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Aye. Okay.
Okay, so, Your Honor. Who seconded? I didn't hear that. I did. Okay. Okay. So, I guess, raise your hands and let me see who said yes. Who said no? Motion fails. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Your Honor, I make a motion we adjourn. Second. Second.